Welcome to Grab the MD. Be sure to subscribe, like my videos, and spread the word. This is going to be a long video because we are going to discuss some of the previous topics in a lot more detail. Uh, let's dive in and see the things that change cardiac output, either increase or decrease it. Uh, we have stroke volume, afterload, preload, contractility, and myocardial oxygen demand. We know cardiac output equals stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. So first off, we look at stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped out in a single heartbeat, right? Let's see how we can increase stroke volume. One way to do this is by increasing force of contraction. A fancy word for that is contractility. Doing so, we get more blood out of the heart with each beat. So stroke volume increases and cardiac output goes up. We see that during exercise and anxiety, both of which activate sympathetic system. Another way to increase stroke volume is by increasing preload, which really means we are having more blood coming into the heart. As a result, we pump out more blood. Stroke volume goes up and so does cardiac output. This is seen in early pregnancy or giving someone normal saline both of which result in increased plasma volume. Third way we can get more blood out is by reducing the afterload, which means less resistance. Heart has easier time pumping out more blood. More blood out means increased stroke volume and cardiac output. We can decrease afterload by dilating the arteries using a drug such as hydralazine. In heart failure, the stroke volume decreases as well as cardiac output. We have two types of heart failure, systolic and diastolic. In systolic failure, the heart muscle can't contract properly because it's damaged, so less blood is pumped out, giving us a low stroke volume. In diastolic failure, we have a stiff heart so its muscle can't relax properly to be stretched out and filled. Decreased amount of blood is coming in, so a decreased amount will be going out. That's how both types of heart failure give us a decreased stroke volume and cardiac output. Let's talk about afterload. It's the resistance to blood flow by constricting arteries. This resistance can be approximated by mean arterial pressure. If we have increased mean arterial pressure, we can say the afterload is high. The heart still has to pump out blood. To overcome the high resistance or afterload, it has to contract with much more force, meaning the cardiac muscle has to be under lots of stress. This has a clinical significance which brings us to Laplace's law, which says ventricular wall stress equals pressure multiplied by radius divided by two cross wall thickness. We can ignore radius for now. As per equation, if we have high pressure, for example, hypertension, ventricular wall will have lots of stress all the time. So the heart increases the thickness of its muscle to try to reduce the stress because the heart doesn't like stress. That's how we get left ventricular hypertrophy in chronic hypertension, which is a bad thing. So we give them vasodilators to reduce the mean arterial pressure and afterload. For example, hydralazine, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs. That brings us to preload, which is the outward stretch of myocardium by blood at the end diastolic volume. The more the end diastolic volume, the more the stretch. How do we get more end diastolic volume? By increasing venous return. And how do we increase venous return? By constricting the veins or by having more blood in our system. So venous constriction increases venous return, gives us more end diastolic volume, 
which increases the preload. Similarly, more blood in veins, as seen after a normal saline infusion, means more blood coming back to hurt, which also increases the preload. Increasing the preload increases cardiac output, meaning the hurt is working harder. What if we want the hurt to rest a bit, like during an engine attack? To do that, we use venous dilators to reduce preload and decrease the workload on hurt. That's why we use nitroglycerin in angina management. Remember, ACE inhibitors and ARBs relax both veins and the arteries, so they decrease both preload and afterload. The fourth variable to affect cardiac output is contractility which means force of contraction generated by cardiac muscle. More forceful contractions give us increased cardiac output. To understand this, we need to know how a cardiac muscle contracts. Uh, let's say we have a single muscle cell with its sarcoplasmic reticulum inside. Sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium, which is a good thing. Caricolamines increase storage of calcium within sarcoplasmic reticulum. When it's time for muscle contraction, calcium from outside enters the cell. Caricolamines increase this calcium entry. Once inside, calcium goes to sarcoplasmic reticulum and opens a channel for more calcium to come out into the cytoplasm where actin and myosin are waiting and contraction starts. We have a pump called sodium-potassium ADPase, whose job is to get potassium into the cell and bring sodium out into the extracellular space. This extracellular sodium tries to go back into the cell in exchange for calcium coming out via a sodium-calcium exchanger. Calcium out means less contraction. Caricolamines try to reduce this extracellular sodium so calcium stays in. So caricolamines such as epinephrine increase intracellular calcium and reduce extracellular exchange of calcium. The net effect, more calcium inside, increased contractility, and so increased cardiac output. The second drug that increases contractility is digoxin. It does so by blocking the sodium-potassium pump. No sodium out, no exchange with calcium. Calcium stays inside to be used in contraction. That's why digoxin is used in heart failure to improve pumping. There are things that decrease contractility, but keep in mind that caricolamines do all the things we discussed earlier by activating beta-1 receptors on HERT. So if we use beta-1 blockers, beta-1 activity, levels of cyclic AMP, and contractility will go down. Remember, beta-1 receptors work by generating cyclic AMP. If beta-1 goes down, cyclic AMP levels also go down. In systolic heart failure, cardiac muscle can't contract, so the contraction force is weak. Acidosis reduces contractility, such as ischemia, where oxygen is present in the blood but not going to tissues. So, the affected tissue survives by activating anaerobic glycolysis which gives us lots of hydrogen. Hydrogen competes with calcium for cell entry. So less calcium is present inside the cell for contraction and we get a weaker force of contraction. Hypoxia, which is decreased oxygen in the blood, also works similarly. Non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, verapamil and diltiazem, block cytoplasmic calcium channels, Less calcium going in results in decreased contractility. I'm talking about this channel here. The last variable to affect contractility is myocardial oxygen demand, 
which is how much oxygen is needed by the herb to work. More work means more oxygen needed. For example, increased contractility means more work. Increased afterload means more resistance for the herd to work against and hence more work. Increasing herd rate means herd is running fast and more work. Increased diameter of left ventricle seen after increasing venous return means it has to recoil back forcefully to pump the blood out as per Starling's law. So when more oxygen is available, heart works better and we have a better cardiac output. When oxygen is low, we have a poor cardiac output. That's it for now. I know it was a long video, so get some rest, but first subscribe to my channel and like and share my videos.